So hi, everybody. Um, I guess we'll introduce ourselves and then we'll go to share screen. My name is Ann Fiddler. I'm from CUNY, the City University of New York. I'm the open education librarian there and I run the OER initiatives across our 24 campuses. And I'm Retta Chaffee. I'm the Director of Educational Technology at Granite State College, where I, I oversee the online program and we are part of the University System of New Hampshire. Hi, I'm Bob Awkward. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Academic Effectiveness at the Massachusetts Department of Higher Education. And in that role, among the roles I have, I serve as the coordinator, our OER coordinator, statewide coordinator. So I'm delighted to be here and I see lots of familiar names among the uh, participants. So glad to see you all here. Okay, so um, yeah, me too. Glad to see you all here. Lots of familiar names and faces. Um, okay, so we are here um, as colleagues who represent uh, DOERS, which is uh, stands for Driving OER Sustainability for Student Success. And I'm going to give you a little background of it because um, CUNY and SUNY and Maryland were the founding members. And we started out about 2017 when uh, New York came into some a windfall uh, back in 2017, based on our work with Achieving the Dream, uh, OER uh, degree initiative with community colleges that was national. Uh, we got the we got um, the eye of the governor of New York State, and he decided to start funding uh, open educational resources. And Maryland was also getting some funding, and we all came together and we decided. Uh, really spearheaded by MJ Bishop from Maryland to launch something called, that we came up with called Doers. So we sort of put our heads together and the idea behind it was thinking that, you know, we as uh, collaborative systems could lend our weight to some thinking around OER, as you're all uh, aware that, you know, publishers have been coming at us and, you know, ed tech companies have been coming at us and trying to capitalize on you know this growing movement of OER. And in order to sort of drive the thinking behind it, we thought we could be more powerful together than apart. So you know we could control uh, we could we could have better control. So the idea was to um, to recruit, if you will, um, public education higher ed systems statewide and turns out province-wide because Canada has also uh, joined us in, in a big way. <clears throat> and and we can address and we can share our concerns and address these concerns. Uh, the focus was to sustain OER and achieve equity and student success at scale. Um, we coordinate and collaborate um, with these groups. So um, you can read our statement of purpose at doers3.org. Uh, somebody would just drop that in the chat for me. That would be great. And you can also find a list of our projects there, and you can see specifically the equity OER rubric that we're going to be talking about here today. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a map of our membership as it was actually a little while ago. This hasn't been updated in a little while. Um, we have been getting a lot of interest from um, systems nationally, Canada, and this is just what we represent as of a couple of months ago, which is 25 systems or and initiatives, 688 colleges plus and universities, and we reach over 6 million students. So the impact is really huge. I mean, I'll give you just a figure from CUNY, you know, since we've been at this, uh, since about 2016, 2017, we have uh, converted over 30,000 courses and sections to OER, saving our students over $60 million in just about four years. So the impact is incredibly huge. Next slide, please. Hmm. Okay. So just about pre-pandemic, um, we had this suddenly huge group of people working together and we were able to come together in person. I think that was the last thing we did in person was summer of 2019. We met in Little Rock and we had a mini kind of conference and we, um, we came up with um, 
output that we could give to the world, that we could work together on things that, you know, actual projects. So we came up with a research work group, which does a landscape analysis of, you know, what's happening with OER. Uh, they came up, they're coming up with data standards for OER and, and open education research. We also have a capacity building work group. <clears throat> we have, on, I believe it's a, um, a presentation here uh, this week on tenure and promotion, a tenure and promotion matrix that was kind of, that um, Andy McKinney, my colleague at CUNY and Amanda um, from BC campus worked on, and they're going to be sharing that that's getting out into the world as well. You can also see that on our on our work on our website. Uh, <clears throat> they also did a re, um, they also um, looked into campus store practices for listing and fulfillment, how to how to bookstores. Uh, deal with OER in the bookstore and get it in the hands of students. And then this group is the equity work group. And we worked on a blueprint for the role of OER in closing equity gaps. And we came up with um, a blueprint as well as a rubric, which is what we're gonna be talking about here today. Next slide, please. So the idea behind the blueprint is to define, unpack and explain multiple dimensions of equity and foreground the role of OER in closing equity gaps. I mean, I'll say for myself, and I think for, for others as well, is that, you know, in, in creating this and, and reviewing this, you know, I think we feel that OER is equity. I mean, OER creates equity. It is, it is in and of itself. I mean, of course, there's the cost savings and all the other things, but, you know, certainly from my QD point of view and how um, open pedagogy has really um, nestled right beside it and taken off as a you know heartfelt thing on on our campuses i think you know oer and equity are one and the same so the key components to this uh, blueprint are <clears throat> the theoretical and research foundation i'm uh, sorry uh, the key components of doers are these three things so we have the theoretical research group we have the equity through oer rubric and then we have case studies uh, case studies we're going to talk about a little bit later uh, next slide, please. Okay, so, you know, the time has always been now, but the time is particularly now since we've been through and are living through this pandemic. Uh, you know, one of the things that our campuses have, have come to through the pandemic, among many other things, is, aha, oh, that OER would have been really useful had we all been getting on board right before now. So, you know, we all see and, you know, all of the equity issues that have risen through the pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to hand it over to Bob at this time, and he's going to talk a little bit about the specific rubric. Thank you, Anne. So equity, you're reading the definition that our equity work group developed. Um, and of course, this uh, was informed by the work of many other people including Sarah Lambert's work and AAC and U's work and in inclusive excellence. So we kind of pull all that together to come up with what we thought was an important, uh, a, a driving definition to keep us all focused on what were we, what did we mean in doers when we were talking about the work of equity. And uh, as you can see, it both uh, is, uh, it sets a framework, but also gives us a, a direction to be able to move on it because it's not just enough just to talking about equity, but we have to walk the talk, um, as Tia Brown McNair would say, we have to walk our talk to make it real. <clears throat> Next slide, please. In that regard, we felt it was important to come up with some core values to drive the work that we were doing. And all of this was because as we were, as we sat around and worked on this, we thought, you know, everybody is trying to struggle with these same issues as we are. And so if we're going to try to add to the dialogue and add something new and different and helpful, then we need to develop some clear guide, guide you know, rules of the road for ourselves, some guideposts. So these core values, learner-centered OER promotes these intersectional outcomes of equity, inclusion, and accessibility. So those those there's an intersection there and then in, in, in that vortex in that nexus is a lot of rich opportunity and work. Recognizing and redressing inequities requires taking responsibility. So again, recognizing, but also then redressing those inequities 
uh, requires taking responsibility and note both in a personal, professional, individual, and institutional level. It's all of the above. You got to be all in in this game. That equity and quality are joined together, that equity and quality should be synonymous. And that in fact, doing this work of equity and not ensuring quality becomes a hollow promise. And finally, that higher education and achieving equity results in students' success through access, participation, persistence, completion, and entry should be fundamental and foundational to all of our efforts. Next slide, please. So the equity blueprint. What do we mean when we're talking about the equity blueprint? Uh, as Anne alluded, there were three components that made up this work that we did. The first was, um, and I should say that it should be important to say that we, one, we felt one shouldn't engage in this work if you're not also willing to address equity since OER by definition increases access and challenges traditional power structures and structural barriers to student success. So in order to do that, we thought, one, we need to establish a theoretical framework and research foundation for what we're doing. So it can't be just because we say so that this is important and you everyone should do this. We need to go look at the research and see what others have said. How have OER programs worked to improve access and affordability, deepen student learning, and close equity gaps, especially for marginalized students. And that's what the Theoretical Research Foundation is to capture as much of that work, which is all emergent, as you know, around the nation, uh, around this work. From that, we said, all right, the next then element is the development of the rubric, which is where I'm gonna spend the bulk of my time talking about, which is, okay, so say I wanna do this at my institution, at my department or at my, uh, my um, division, my institution, how would I go and do this? How would I know if we're doing it or not doing it? And then finally, case studies, because once we say, yes, you, here's why one should do this, here's a way to assess whether or not you're doing this. Then the third is, is anybody else doing this? And that's what the case studies was a way to be able to demonstrate that there are folks already starting to do this work now. We don't have the case studies here, but if you go on that Doer's website, you will be able to find there are th three case studies there now, and this is a, a, this is work that's ongoing. We're continuing to add to those case studies as we go forward. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so equity through the o, through OER rubrics, and now we're going to start going to get a little more granular here. This is a tool that this work group developed over many months of many months of hard work putting this together, drawing again, looking at work that other people have done, drawing on our own experiences from our campuses, from working with students and faculty, et cetera. And we felt uh, it was uh, that this tool, which is, in, is licensed as CCBY, and it is in fact designed to be adapted, adopted and customized by those who seek to utilize and approve upon it. And we felt it needed to have three elements to it. One, it had to have, it had to assess the scale of adoption. Like, where are you? It's a continuum. You're not doing anything to, you're doing this aspirational level. I think for most institutions, it would be an aspirational level. So we needed some scale so people could figure out where they are, which is on our X axis. And then on the Y axis, who is it that's doing this work? And so we had to identify who are the key stakeholders and what are those areas that they would be focusing on? And then finally, the action. What actions would one take? And that's the intent is, this, is to use this tool to assess where your institution or your department or your unit is relative to some standard. So you can figure out what steps do we need to take to move our work forward? So let's again, go down another level. Next slide, please. And look at the scale of adoption. So again, this is the uh, x-axis, if you will, of this rubric. So we go from not present to established. 
Um, and the point of this is, I mean, as you can see, not present means that no attention is being paid to uh, OER at all. And then you go to beginning stage. So there's tension is beginning, but it's ad hoc between units and or institutions to an emergent scale where it's more coordinated and intentional. A plan is being discussed and or under develop, development. And then finally, you get to the established level <clears throat> where you have units and or institutional wide foundations in place, a comprehensive plan for action and assessment and continuous improvement. So that's what each of those stages of adoption would represent. Not present, beginning, emerging, and established. And as I suggested, in my view, the established is really aspirational, I think for most campuses. And I remember I, we had a great discussion about that uh, established level and was like, is that something that people, can, can, people are going to meet? And we all agree. Well, the whole point is we want to have something to, for people to strive towards. So all of us, all of our systems and institutions. So that's the X uh, axis. And then next slide. Stakeholder categories and dimensions. So on the Y axis, then we have students who are certainly a, obviously a key stakeholder in this work. And then within students, that's the stakeholder category. And what are some of those elements or dimensions that we would want to consider. Uh, equitable availability. Is there equitable availability? Is there, uh, do students have access to the technology, which obviously is critical to their ability to use OER and student awareness of OER. Similar for practitioners, uh, you can see more, more, more depth in there. Again, what are some of their dimensions around instruction, pedagogy, and content is critical, obviously, for practitioners multiple dimensions of infrastructure, including staff support, course marking, IT support, and bookstores. Because again, for the practitioners and for anyone using OER, those are critical steps that have to be in place that will, will make the difference on where your, your program is going to be. And then finally, the role of leadership, um, which includes, is there ongoing assessment and continuous improvement? of the OER program and looking at it in multiple ways, St strategically, goals, goals, policy and staffing, instructor incentives, professional development and recognition. Now, just in case you get a little nervous, like, oh my goodness, there's a lot going on here. We're, in the next couple of slides, we're actually gonna show you some, some snippets of the rubric so you can see it. Again, if you go to doers3.org, you can see the full blown uh, rubric there. And because uh, as you can see, imagine from the X and Y axis, it's pretty, it's pretty large document. It's several pages to do this. So next slide, we're gonna look at the practitioners. And we just picked a couple just so you could start kind of see what are we talking about? So again, across the top, you can see not present, beginning, emerging, established, and then um, down the uh, Y axis, the first one of the the first element instruction and pedagogy so you can again remember from that last list there were several dimensions that we were looking at for pedagogy the first one being instruction and pedagogy and then there were uh, the multiple dimensions of infrastructure in the subcategory so now you can look at your screen and see all right what so how would you do how would you use this right how would you use this at your institution so if you're assessing your own, and this is important, that uh, that you do a critical assessment of your institution. And I, let me just say this, I think this is important to say that in doing, the, in using this tool, our intent is that people would use it to assess where they are in order to determine where they wanna go to. This is not about evaluation. It's not about shaming. Oh, you're bad that you haven't done this. We all are where we are right? We, everyone is where they are, but you never know is that good or bad unless you have something to compare it against. And that's why we felt this rubric would be helpful for people to kind of get a sense where is our program today? And in each of these elements, you're going to be in different places, but then what's, where are we, where are we trying to get to? And what is it we would have to do to get there? Because then that leads you to be able to develop, okay, an OAR plan, here are the things we need to do to advance our work. And then that's how we know we've arrived once, once we got there. So this is really intentional to try to take something that's somewhat uh, maybe 
esoteric and make it concrete. So not present, no attention's paid to inclusive pedagogy. Faculty of diverse voices are not represented. No incentive for professional development, uh, financial technical support. Faculty receive no recognition. I think you would all agree that would say that OER and equity is not present at that institution. Then you move to beginning. You have growing awareness and action to ensure faculty of diverse voices, but again, growing awareness. So it's just starting to happen. Um, that would include attention to biases and images in multimedia. That's starting to happen. Diversity, equity, and inclusion statements and expression of commitment made by faculty in some departments, by faculty in some departments. So it's still kind of ad hoc. It's not, you know, whole, it's not the whole institution. It's not planful. Then you move to emerging level. Faculty of diverse voices are more equitably represented among instructors across departments. Culturally and ability inclusive OER content is widely adopted. So you can feel how the dimensions of level of the adoption are increasing. The scope is increasing. Instructors increasingly have access to incentives to engage with OER. And then you get to the established level, again, which I said is aspirational. The faculty of diverse voices are represented equitably among instructors using OER institution-wide. That would clearly be a step above emerging. All instructors have access to ongoing and sustained professional development. All instructors have access to sustained grant programs to incentivize and support adoption and creation of OER. And faculty receive full recognition for OER emergent engagement in tenure and promotion for which there's a, another presentation that's gonna be happening this week on that from doers on the tenure and promotion work, by the way, you might wanna catch that. So hopefully you can get that sense how as we go across the scale of adoption, the scope and the impact increases as you move along. And that's, again, that's just one element, one dimension that we pick. Now, just to give you another example, the last example, next slide, leadership. So again, you see the same not present beginning, emerging and established. And Again, the first element, the first dimension, ongoing assessment, quantitative and qualitative. Because obviously that's critical. You have to constantly be assessing what we're doing to see how we can improve upon that. Again, I'm just highlighting, not present. There is no assessment of OER, no support for identification of designation, designated roles, student success data. I, I mean, there's nothing going on. <laughs> that, that would clearly be not present as opposed to you get to the beginning level. Assessment is beginning. Uh, and then we try to give some examples of what does that mean when we say it's beginning? Attention is being paid to some selected areas, but not all areas. I mean, we're looking at a few things, cost savings, uh, who's responsible for assessment. So, we, so, you know, folks have put the toes in the water, but they're just beginning. Then you get to emerging, more coordinated assessment of OER and its role in advancing equities taking place, both quantitative and quanti qualitative. And again, we then start spelling out cost savings to students, looking at return on investment, looking at utilization um, data, right? Those would be some examples of things that would be happening if you had an emerging plan. And then finally you get to the established level and you see comprehensive quantitative and qualitative assessment plan is in a place across all units and institution wide. Again, looking at those various sub elements that I've pointed out. And I think, again, you could see, oh yeah, that's, if you were doing established, that would absolutely be clearly different from the emerging level, which would be getting from beginning and not present. So hopefully that gives you some sense of how this rubric would actually, how you would operate and work with this rubric. Now, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Riet Retta, who's gonna talk about epiphanies of the rubric. Thank you, Bob. So um, uh, there were a lot of epiphanies when we um, were working on these rubrics, and and I'll have to say we've had we had so many meetings where there was you know dialogue about this, um, and and what would, what became clear is that the um, 
the quality and the equity are intertwined. It was it was difficult to to just look at it at it one way or the other because with equity came quality. Um, and these were things as as we were developing these rubrics that um, it, it became clear to us that the the high levels of quality um, and and uh, the institutional effectiveness were really intertwined with that equity piece. Um, and then the next one is that uh, that it it has to be embedded in the OER pro programs that this isn't this isn't an afterthought that that you you add on in the end that um, as you increase your your um, the quality of your programs you're also increasing that equity as one of the the key components so um, it, this came you know it came comes to the point that it is the comprehensiveness of of these strategies intertwine with each other so um, we've talked a little bit about the blueprints. We've talked about uh, the rubrics that uh, um, it, programs or departments or institutions can use. But we also wanted to include some case studies in, in our work. And again, if you go to the doers3.org and go to projects, you can see the OER um, accessibility project, and it'll have a list of these case studies in detail. <clears throat> so the three that we have right now are the Affordable Learning Georgia and Accessibility. And in this case study, um, the Affordable Learning Georgia was expanding their OER options um, in, in uh, the adoption. So they were looking at how do we how do we get more people to use OER in their courses? And this inevitably led to creating new OER. And um, this was, uh, you know, one of the things when you create OER, oftentimes, uh, you know, faculty will create OER for the class and they, they, you know, they share it and here it is. Well, they also needed, uh, when we start sharing these out, um, you, you want to make sure that they're accessible. So that was one of the requirements. They provided lots of training on that, but um, that they, uh, they discovered that making them completely accessible was a challenge. So um, they are uh, working on, they've worked on uh, increasing the accessibility of OER that they're putting out there. So that's a that's one of the case studies that um, you can read about. The next one with BC Campus. Um, this was a project where um, that uh, the accessibility they created the accessibility toolkit, um, and this was a, a project to help individuals that are creating OER, how to make them um, accessible from the beginning. And, it, and if you're if you're ever working on a project and then it, it, in the afterthought, it's like, oh, I've got to do all these things. So this is some um, this is a tool that can be used to uh, to to make it part of the planning and development of whatever OER. Um, and they they provided professional development as well with that that particular project. In the last one, the Ohio State University, they um, uh, originally were promoting OER to reduce costs and they got a grant in autumn of 2020 and they um, they uh, were were working to incorporate racial justice into the program and they um, encouraged faculty that were working on this project to share to share their resources um, openly for students to be able to access. So um, again, not enough time to go into all of these uh, all of these case studies, but you can access them and read from uh, read about them. Uh, a great way to you know understand some of the challenges and how they were addressed along the way. We'll be making other case studies available in the future. Um, if any of you might have case studies that you think might be of interest to add to our collection, there are some guidelines 
that's um, in the same location where you'll see the, the case studies. If you scroll down to the bottom, um, you can download those guidelines. So where are we today? Um, the, the committee that is working on equity has agreed that our work is not done. Uh, we, we put a lot of effort into the resources that we did create, but we realized this is just the beginning. And um, these are a couple of the items that we are going to continue to work on into the future. And one of them is the, um, you know, having real life pilots of using these rubrics. We, we understand that uh, this was our first shot and that until we start implementing and using it, um, we're not going to know what needs to be uh, improved on or updated on that rubric. So we're um, promoting uh, pilots of, of using this rubric so we can, we can gather the information and make improvements to the rubric as we're presenting it to the public. Um, we are also looking to um, looking for a, a more solidified plan of getting those case studies uh, and adding them to our collection because there's so many there's so much to learn from from individual experiences and sometimes you come to a conference and you can learn and people love to share but if we could have a collection where um, we we can share those out and people can access them as needed that's that's another one of our um, goals, and then we're looking for uh, for funding. Um, and I know that we, I, I believe, we do have funding in order to promote some of these um, these efforts and getting our resources out there. So um, that's where we are right now. Uh, we've mentioned the doers uh, website and uh, the rubrics several times. This is just to show you exactly where you'll find it, doers3.org and go to projects. Uh, you also see that there's a list of members that are participating. You can see the institutions in um, uh, statewide works that are, uh, that are currently members of doers3 which leads us to questions. So um, I'd like to open it up for questions now, if anyone would like further information. And I have not been monitoring the chat, so. Um, okay, so Adriana is asking Dr. Awkward if, about the other presentation, and I can answer that question too. It's, um, uh, the OER, uh, the tenure and promotion OER matrix, and I don't know exactly when it is. I don't know if anyone else. Yeah, I'd have to look through the, I was gonna go look at the schedule and find where it is. It's uh, Andrew McKinney and Amanda yes. Coolidge are the presenters. So yeah, if you yes. search that way. Any other questions or comments? Uh, any any of you who, who want to share your own stories or what you may have learned? And I see we have one from Jonathan who is asking, is it implicit in the idea of a rubric that you think that success will look the same at all institutions? I'll, I'll, I'll just um, do that briefly, but I'm sure others have more to add to this. I think, you know, one of the things, especially with this rubric being open, we, we don't expect that it'll look the same for, for every institution in that, Everybody has different um, different constraints or um, perhaps opportunities, and that that is why you can you can customize this rubric to to meet um, you know the types of the the types of resources and, and opportunities that you might have within your um, within your own system. However, uh, you know I think the success the success you you know and I think. Bob said this 
pretty clearly it's it's the aspirational you know where where can you go from here and every time as you as you learn more and as you progress and add uh, add to your own initiative you'll you'll find ways that um, can maybe improve it a little bit more because we don't know everything yet um, but we're we're definitely striving to do so yeah, I, I would agree with that, um, you know, because I see uh, 24 institutions and their own ideas of what their success is like and everybody's different. Um, I think the idea behind writing this for us was it's more thinking points, you know, maybe you hadn't thought of this before and it's something that you can consider. Um, we also We also encourage iterations of this for your own version of your success. Was today. Any any other questions? Uh, looks like the uh, session is today at two o'clock. It's entitled "Building Capacity for Your OER Initiative: Doers Three, and includes both Amanda Coolidge, Andrew McKinney, who co-led the. Um, Tenure and Promotion Work Group and Kevin Corcoran, who was the chair for the Doers Three, 2 p.m. EDT, of course. Building um, capacity for your OER initiative. So uh, Karen, thank you for your uh, comment about quality. I don't know if many of you have read uh, Inside Higher Ed yesterday, there was an, an opinion piece about um, OER and the opinion was that it was not high quality, which was very enraging to me. Um, so, uh, so thanks for your opinion about the quality. I, I agree with you. I think that OER uh, affords higher quality than not if it's thoughtfully used. Hmm. Karen just shared a comment at my college, the equity people and the OER people are not working together and I'm not sure how to get them connected. Um, you know, this rubric might be something interesting that you want to share with them or the blueprint um, as a way if, if they haven't yet made that connection. Mm-hmm. I'm curious, did do people find this? Obviously, you came to the session to hear what we had. Do you find this is uh, something that could be a useful tool to help you at your institution, particularly as you have a if you have an OER team or task force that you pull together? It seems to me this is a good first activity to uh, bring people together and do use this tool as a way to assess where you all are today versus where you'd like to be, because from that, again, the gap between where you are and where you'd like to be creates a space that you can then develop a plan of action of saying, here's some things that we could do that will help move our program from where we are to where we'd like to be. And then as in all good processes, then you can remeasure yourself or reassess yourself again, you know, a year later or two years later and say, have we moved this? Have we, have we made progress towards where we're trying to go? Uh, so our emails are, I think, on the next slide, and uh, we are seeing comments that people are interested in using this. Please feel free to give us your feedback. We'd love to hear it, positive and negative. Oh, good. Good, good, good. Very useful. Okay, good. Thanks. Let's see some feedback in here. Okay, and it looks like we are getting ready to wrap up. So um, again, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us and we hope that you enjoyed the presentation. Yeah, and we'll stay on for a couple of minutes if anyone wants to chat, feel free to stay and unmute yourself.
Thank you so much. I'm going to end the, the recording now. The session is visually over. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan.